strikes me. So um, we are fortunate tonight to have the director and the editor and costume designer of this magnificent film. And let's get right to it. Uh, Todd and Jeff and Mark, come on up. I'm Steve Gatos from Variety, that's where I work. How are you? So you still holding the mic there on us. The knife, son. I think you need to turn the lights up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hearing the headlights moment. Um, so I have a question for the audience. How many folks tonight are seeing the movie for the first time? That's kind of amazing. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, in talking to Todd uh, backstage, I decided I'm going to improvise. That was off the record. <laughs> well, this part, I think, was on the record. Oh, okay, go. You like their audiences. And yes. You, and you like to talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, meaning I, I like it when they ask questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Now, all those things were revealed to me about all those <laughs> the actors and the things you told me. Yeah. I, mean, I could never tell those things. Um, also, just one bit of housekeeping. Uh, 11 Oscar nominations, and all of you are amongst the 11. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what, last time I got to do this with three Oscar nominees. But, uh, so I'm going to just start. Um, I decided tonight um, that I'm feeling like I, I've proven enough times how smart I am. So I'm going to not try to prove how smart I am. I'm going to actually go right into audience questions. But I want to start with a very easy question. Um, uh, I think it was for Mark. Um, between David O. Russell, Paul Thomas Anderson, and Clown, Todd Phillips, who's the easiest growing guy to work with? <laughs> Todd Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You know, I do stand up also, so that was uh, that was the uh, that was the attempt. You know, that, that went over almost as well as Arthur Fleck. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Show there. Uh -huh. um, so let's go to some questions. Uh, I, you know, you just saw a powerful, um, amazing film. I'm just, you know, the world's biggest fan. We'll go to the front row first. So Todd, I know you wanted to initially shoot this on 35. Right. And, uh, Actually, we wanted to shoot it on 70. Really? Yeah, that was the plan. Okay, so yeah. we just didn't want to revise it all. The dilemma was the studio didn't want to spend the money on shooting 70 millimeter film. Uh, so we wanted to stick with large format, so we ended up shooting on the uh, Lexus large format camera but digital. He was asking about how what format we shot the movie on. And uh, and we will you know I'm I'm going to have the audience ask questions as long as we make sure we keep the questions rotating for all three gentlemen who've come out here tonight. Uh, if I can see somewhere in the back, so there's a hand up right in the middle, yes? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to double up with your hat. Go ahead. Uh, Yes. Right. Well, I think you talk, okay, the first question about his shoulders, that's the way Joaquin is. He, he was born, I, I think, I don't want to misquote it, but I think he has a distended shoulder, something like that. It's just the way he actually normally looks. There's no CG body work done with his body. Normally, if you saw him right now with his shirt off, you wouldn't notice it, but when you lose 52 pounds like he lost for the movie, I think some of those things kind of um, jut out or you notice it a little bit more. As far as um, when he leaves Wayne Manor, you know, we're following him pretty level behind his back. But but you said he goes in the elevator and meets the girl, which is an entirely different kind of movie. Right, he sees he sees a he sees a flashback of the girl oh, in the elevator as he's as he's going up to the apartment. But um, yeah, I mean he does 
as, as far as shots? I mean, well, I mean, we generally were always below. We were always fairly low with him, and we ended up coming above him later in the movie. But yeah, I mean, that's just something. I don't. I don't know what the question was, but it was intentional too. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Was yeah. Was and, no, and just yeah. to follow up a point that came out of that, Mark, um, with uh, the physicality of this lead and the weight loss and, and the, the, you know, we wrote about in Variety, the kind of ballet movements and everything. Uh, did that open up from the very beginning some path for you in terms of uh, costumes? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I know Joaquin physique pretty well because we've worked together twice before and he lost Master, a lot of weight. And what was the other one? He lost, yeah, an inherent bite. Okay. And um, he lost a lot of weight for the master as well. So that on his back, and he also knows how to show it um, and make it more pronounced. Um, yeah, you're always working with uh, his choreography moves. He worked really hard to uh, do some kind of Chaplin-esque moves, and you know that might have influenced some of the proportions on his Happy the Clown outfit. You know, and um, I'm always working with my actors with on every aspect of it. He and lost a lot of weight, so we're gonna play that up. And how many steps are Happy the Clown? Is Happy the Clown step one that we see, or did you go through several iterations to get to the Happy the Clown we see? You know, Todd and I talked about it a lot, and-, and um, Yeah, we tried a few looks for the clown. Absolutely, especially hair, makeup, mm -hmm. um, shape. I, I know I was thinking at first one piece, like the typical kind of one piece bozo mm -hmm. outfit, right. and mm -hmm. It didn't seem no, and then we s decided to go a little bit more inspired by Chaplin, but also the the clown look. We wanted to to somehow lead us to the Joker look in the mm -hmm. end, and the vest yeah. and the comedy and the. So how suit. could we? How can we connect those two? That's it was really important to make it be. Uh, you understood maybe where he got those mm -hmm. parts. Mm -hmm. It's really very very realistic mm -hmm. version of those. Interesting. And then the one quick editing question. Uh, I've been around uh, auteur filmmakers and, and been you know, watching them edit films. and uh, I'm not going to assume that it's always done the same way. When you guys got together on this, is there some compass point or some starting point or some goal that you articulate at the beginning or do you just kind of get your stuff and start taking, is it a day at a time process or is there a big um, planning meeting at the beginning of what we're going for? Because you know, when we see the final product, it's executed so beautifully, it feels, it's so impactful to us. The process, is there anything you can do at the very beginning that says, here's what we're trying to get to, or here's what it should feel like? We don't actually talk that much uh, prior to, I think for um, one, I mean, on this one in particular, I thought the script was so clear from the minute I wanted to leave mm -hmm. that it was, there, I didn't have a lot of questions. I kind of, it very clearly understood it. But again, I also don't think you want to prejudice too much what the cut is. Mm -hmm. And we've worked with her together on a few films now, so I think at this point, if you kind of trust the cut that I'm going to put forward out, uh, you know, to show you the first time around. Well, this is a really nice question. Is there any audience testing? No, we didn't do testing. We screened it for friends yeah, that would yeah. come over to the editing room and we would show film so the old fashioned the MSG or whatever it was called. Yeah, 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 we didn't do because not just not because we didn't want to. Warner's was very protective because it's a DC film. We've always done testing on the comedies, but mm -hmm. I think comedies is different sure. because comedies either are funny or they're not. <laughs> <laughs> there's no middle ground, but for this movie there's yeah. no middle ground. Yeah. So you're not necessarily looking for the rhythm of laughs mm -hmm. as you would with a comedy. Yeah. So we weren't so hung and up it's on and it's a there's a per sense of proprietary around it. It's it's yeah. it's IP and it's proprietary. That's and exactly and what Warner's their approach correct. with their DC stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hi, thank you. This question is for Mark. The uh, maroon and orange colors of the costume. Mm -hmm. Did those intentionally match the color of Arkham? Costume? What do you want? She's seen the movie a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, how many times have I seen you at Q and A? This is my third Q and A with you. Third Q and A, but how many times have you seen the movie? Tonight was 35. She's seen oh! the movie 35 times. <laughs> I mean, I know her. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, no, there, there no, it, was it's not. Really true. There, there was n not a conscious connection with that. Um, you know, we get into a rhythm of, of feeling things and and placing. I place changes with a scene, like how this is going to play and what the background is and things. And 
that was just, um, it was, it's sort of while Arthur is getting a little darker, it, the, the, sh the shirts and everything about him is getting a little darker, so that, that was the happy accident, I guess. Yeah. You should be interviewing her, too. I mean, she's she's amazing. 35 times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right in the middle of the lady there and then the other lady. truth is we, we set out to make a film that illustrates, um, I mean, the simple way of saying it, when Scott Silver and I sat down to write it, we wanted to address the sort of lack of empathy in the world. And the idea is that when we treat each other with this kind of discourse and this kind of dismissiveness, uh, you get the villain you deserve. Um, couple that with mental illness, childhood trauma, uh, lack of love, and these are kind of The recipe for someone like Arthur in this movie. We're not. It's not a. It's not a, a warning. It's just, you know, the goal was to make a villain or a villain origin story, and s look at where could Joker come from if we run it through a very realistic lens. But I think what we want you to feel. I mean, me, but I don't want to impose it. Some people I've, I've spoken to many, twenty-one year olds that think it's a great villain origin story for Joker, and I've spoken to other people that realize the movie's really about the power of kindness. And that's something that we wanted you to feel. But it's a hard question to answer because you kind of want people to have their own experience with the movie. It's not belonging to the audience. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And another question right there. I think it. I think it. You know, we're just trying to say, sort of. Uh, he's. We don't know where he got his clothes from. He may have had them for years. Th if there's a little bit of a juvenile quality to some of Arthur's looks, um, uh, you know, I'm always trying to tell a story with the clothes, and, and I'm glad he came away with that. But yeah, by the time he reaches Joker, he's found his rhythm in, in you know, in life and wardrobe. Is it the bathroom scene where he? seems like, like it's after he kills the guys on the train, where he seems like he's found his center. Before that, he's walking in a very funny well, way. Well, yeah. Like he, mean, like, finds his grace. You know? He does have, a, it is the first sort of emergence of Joker. I mean, one another thing, not to get too heady about it, but to go back to what I read, it was talking about what is the movie saying. One of the things we talked a lot about was this sort of Jungian idea that we all walk around with masks on, and Arthur is actually the away at the mask throughout the movie, revealing his true identity, his sort of shadow persona, which is Joker, the person he was meant to be. So the bathroom dance is one of the first sort of chipping away at the mask where we feel Joker emerging. The real guy. Yeah. And you had one more follow-up question. Yeah, yeah. Jeff. What is it like to watch that? I mean, to see that performance I think we probably have different experiences. I don't want to step on you, but for, for me, I was there on the day with him, and Jeff would get the dailies, and Jeff would text me and be like, this is unbelievable. And then, of course, he spent eight months in an editing room staring at it. But on the day, even Mark would be better to speak to. There were days we would just look at each other with our jaws open. And just I mean, we felt like we were getting something magical. The, the, the scary or intimidating part when you're directing a film with stuff like that is you're like, God, I hope this thing adds up to equal 
with what he's doing, you know what I mean? All of our jobs and, and the you know, 15 people that aren't here as part of the thing. I hope we are all bringing our A game like he is and, and, and ultimately I think we did and, and you can watch his big TV and watch the movie, but but yeah, it's it's awe inspiring and it's intimidating because you just want to be all working at that level or watching that. Does it make it harder as an editor to figure out, okay, we got a zillion hours and it's gonna be a two hour movie? Well, it's not so much that you have a zillion hours, it's that you have a lot of options because he, mm. everything he was doing was great. Mm. I mean, he it's might do it in, in five different ways, but yeah. it was all five different great ways. Yeah. I mean, you know. That actually sounds, th that sounds like it would make it tougher. It does, in many ways, because you have to kind of pick a place to start, and yeah. then you go, you say, okay, well, this is great, this is great, you take this one piece, mm. and then you build around it, create a context, and then go back and reevaluate when you can. But as far as watching the footage, I mean, I remember sitting in front of, in front of the footage on the Um, I'll tell you the ultimate compliment, Todd. You made me want to go out and watch a silent movie. Have you seen He Who Laughs? Oh, the Man, the who, man who Laughs. I mean, The Man Who Laughs, you know, everybody loves to talk about Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, and Sydney and Lent Films Network and Serpico, but really the first thing that Scott Silver and I talked about was first inspiration for writing the script of The Man Who Laughs, right. which is a 1927 or 20, yeah, okay. silent film. Uh, which turns out also inspired the original writers of Joker, the comic book in 1940, uh, Bill Finger and... Uh, it was still a new movie, a recent yeah, movie. Yeah, And I sort of heard of it or not heard of it. I literally just watched it last week. Oh, it's and, and, you know, the childhood trauma. Yes, that all came from that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that wasn't so much the movies of the 70s that clearly inspired a lot of the aesthetic and the vibe of this film, but a lot of it came from which not a lot of people pick up on, not a lot of people know that film much more easier if they have any common with yeah. the network. But, um, Great movie, it's worth watching. Yeah, there's a, a lot of things that kind of inspired what, what became. I'm going to go all the way to the back. Yes. Yeah, like an unwitting icon. Uh, he became this unwitting icon. He he didn't mean to be a symbol. You know, he says it on Murray. I don't I don't I don't believe in anything. You know, and it, it's kind of true. And he becomes this symbol to people. And and um, you know, yeah, that was that was very intentional to us w within it um, while we were making it. But but again, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not good. Well, our idea was to, to, to make an origin story about a villain where the villain is the hero, where you love the villain until you can't really love him anymore. And that point is different for different people, um, where they kind of turn on him, and some people don't necessarily, and some people kind of live with him all the time, but it's, it's a little bit about like what happens if you treat the villain like the hero. And he doesn't seek that thing out at all. Of course, He's right. He's got no point of view to say, yeah. follow me. Which is why we keep getting asked all these sequel questions, because it's like, well, now what? This guy, this Arthur, this Joker is not going to be the crown prince of crime in yeah. Gotham yeah, yeah, City. Yeah. That's just not who That's he not is. Who is no. So what does that look like, <laughs> this Gotham, you know, and this Joker? <laughs> the studio of the tree. Uh, in the <laughs> far back, uh, yeah, there you go. Well, that's a great question. I, I, I made a conscious choice. It wasn't so much comedy versus not. It was a, a conscious choice for me. This is my 10th uh, studio film. And um, I made a conscious choice to change basically everyone I worked with outside of Jeff and Larry, the DP, who I've worked with on many movies. Outside of that, down, I've never worked with Mark before, Mark Freeberg, who's the production designer. Never, I mean, everybody, all the, all the, all the key people. 
personally wanted to mix it up because sometimes what happens is you get this shorthand and it almost becomes easy and they go, and this sounds horrible, but people start to speak for you in that. If you work with somebody for six times, they go, I know what Todd wants, I'm not gonna ask him. Mm -hmm. But I actually prefer to ask and have the conversations about the size of Joker's suit and all the little things Mark and I had to talk about because mm -hmm. Mark didn't know me. And because I wanted to have those conversations because everything wanted to be dug into on this movie. So yeah, it wasn't though as much about comedy versus not, I'm doing, you know, it's really just about changing it up all around. New themes. Yeah. This is the, uh, this side of the room, all the way in the back. Well, I mean, we, to answer just from the writing perspective, the goal was to run everything, as I said, through a realistic lens. We wanted to um, give a real reason why everything exists in Joker. So we wanted to adhere to certain things of the comic. Well, he has a white face and green hair. Okay, why does he have that? In the comic, he fell into a vat of acid. I, I don't necessarily believe if you fall into a vat of acid, you're gonna have white <laughs> skin and green hair. <laughs> So we, we wanted to give a real reason why he looks like that at the end. Okay, what if he's a clown for hire and that kind of inspires the look? Um, another thing we knew about Joker, he has that laugh. Where does that laugh come from? Oh, well, you know, there's this condition that exists and you get it from childhood trauma. Oh, that could tie into our thing with the mom and the child. So all these things, it's sort of a backwards engineering. So it wasn't so much that we wanted to make a comic book film for people that didn't like comics. We just wanted to really run it through as realistic a lens as possible, make everything feel grounded. And you had a second question? For me, I don't really know those movies. <laughs> He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, and I, I've never done one. I don't know what it goes into it. The, the kind of movie that we make, I'm much more comfortable with, kind of a story-driven, character-driven, realistic, urban, gritty kind of film. So, I, you know, I, I thought it was per right up my alley. I have no, I wouldn't know how to start, really, on a on a Spider-Man or something like that. that yeah, was I wasn't huge, worried about Mark fumbling in, in, into yeah. that world because Mark is so <laughs> in the other world right. in a way. In terms of editing, I mean, I suppose you could say that there's that we there's two things that we did. You know, with the fantasy, is they ultimately just feel very real, and we don't really a lot of what is fantasy and reality gets blurred, and we were looking to make that feel real um, with the editing. We weren't looking to to set that apart in any way. It was part of him being an unreliable narrator, if you will, and then also, um, go on, Mark. Sorry, I don't know, I, I guess that's it. <laughs> but there's, a, there's probably a pace, if you go see a Marvel film or a Star Wars film, there is a pacing to them. Yes, actually, that, that is what I was gonna say, is that we, you know, even uh, during the cut, we would go back and, and look through scenes and say, where can we remove cuts? Whereas you'll see a lot of action films will have lots of cuts, you know, kind of per minute. This we would say, okay, where where can we let this this shot play? Where can we let Joaquin's performance play out longer in this shot? And maybe take one shot here, one shot there out, and have the scene like the net uh, end result of the scene be the same. I mean, the basic approach to the whole thing from us, from me down to every level of the crew was let's really take an indie film approach to this studio movie slash comic book movie. We weren't even talking so much about comic book films just sort of an indie approach to it as a studio film. You know, I'm gonna wrap it up, but I, I have a, a question which we, you know, we can abandon if it's, I, I would say it's semi-coherent, maybe it's incoherent, but what's the enemy of a film like Joker in the making of it? What, you, you know, some movies, you only have a 28 day schedule or a 40, and, and you know you're just pushing the envelope because you don't have quite enough time to shoot what you need to shoot, or you don't have quite enough money 
or you wound up on a location where the weather is, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, was, yeah. there, was there something you felt could make this whole thing kind of go topsy-turvy and not, not happen the way you wanted? Well, I wouldn't say it's the enemy, but one of the things that I hadn't been used to doing when you tackle one of these movies is I, I've always made movies that, while you're making them, fly way under the radar. It's hard to make a movie mm -hmm. in New York mm -hmm. City mm -hmm. called Joker mm -hmm. with Joaquin mm -hmm. and fly under the radar. So yeah. that, I wasn't prepared for the level of, you know, we're shooting a scene that day and it's that night it's on the internet. And, and when I say on the internet, yeah. meaning there's video footage yeah, and yeah. there's stills and you know, I so the I, spotlight on the you spotlight making a the movie. The simple answer would be the wow, spotlight okay. uh, was the enemy of the movie. Yeah. We got around it, and those are kind of uptown problems if people want to see it. That's a good thing, um, but it was it was definitely something I wasn't totally prepared for. Well, I think as the only guy up here, because I am the vampire with Chad, I actually worked on indie movies in the '70s mm -hmm. and uh, auteur movies in the '70s. I just have to tell you, I just think this is one of the 